Welcome to the Finance Committee meeting of February 25th. Um, once again, we're under the governor's order for remote access. We're Zooming, and all votes will be roll call votes. Uh, to establish our quorum, we'll do a roll call of attendance. Denny. Here. Sorry. Josette. Yes. Allie. Here. Andrew. Here. Steve. Here. Susan. Here. Jeff. Here. Kathleen. Here. Uh, Brian. Here. Doug. Here. Mark. Here. Lisa. Here. Yeah, okay. uh, Lucy uh, is not in yet. And myself, we have 13 in attendance. On our agenda tonight is uh, employee benefits and assessments and public safety. Uh, Jim's going to start us off with the um, assessments and employee benefits. Jim? Sure. So if um, you'd like, we'll just kind of handle the same way that we've done this in the past, and you guys can just put a hold on something if it comes up. Um, so first item in this section, and uh, I'm looking at this right now, uh, the one I sent out. Uh, Page one's at the bottom. Uh, employee retirement assessment, total amount $6,071,806. Unemployment compensation, $350,000. Hold. Hold, Okay. okay. Uh, employee fringe benefits, uh, total bottom line, $11,578,684. Uh, casualty insurance, uh, 966839 uh, Total transfer to stabilization, zero, for a total amount of uh, $18,997,329. Okay. All right, we'll go back to Andrew for the hold on unemployment compensation. Thank you. Through you, uh, Mark, uh, to Jim, uh, this is a, a real difficult line item, I imagine, to... Uh, project. Uh, so my first question is actually about fiscal year 21, uh, with 350,000, obviously a big jump from the past year's trends, given COVID. Uh, you may have already mentioned this in, in um, past meetings this cycle, but where are we tracking in terms of that uh, towards three, 350,000? I actually thought that would come up. So uh, Jody pulled the most recent numbers this morning for me. Uh, as of right now, we have $280,000 left in that account. Um, obviously, the schools and uh, on the town side, we did a significant amount of furloughs uh, back at the end of last fiscal year. And it trickled into this, this current fiscal year, mostly with uh, the recreation department and the recreation employees, library employees, a couple in town hall, and one over in the police uh, and a couple, I think some of the teachers were able to carry forward into the, but for the most part, um, the COVID relief funds that we've received, um, if we hadn't received those funds, we would have completely gone through this fifth, 350. Val Donahue's tracking it for me. Uh, last time I checked, we were up way over a million dollars in claims. So, um, you know, so it's paid off. The reason I, I, you know, I went back and forth about whether or not to go forward with 350 again, there's just so many unknowns. You guys know. I don't know when the, the if the federal government's going to sign this third stimulus bill, or if it's going to trickle down to local and state governments. You know, is there going to be any um, anything in there? So I just level funded it at the three hundred and fifty. So right now we we still have two hundred and eighty left in that account. Great, thank you. And through you, Mark, uh, just to follow up for the um, two hundred and eighty or so thousand that's currently remaining in the first fiscal year. Is that like most line items, something that would roll into free cash if we don't use it all? That is correct, it will. Okay, great. Yeah, this is, um, I'll just end with a comment. I, I'm fine with 350,000 because of the uncertainties, you know, could there be a virus variant that uh, causes uh, uh, the economy to have a downturn again? So I, I'm fine with that, uh, especially because it would roll into free cash uh, if not used, but, um, you know, with the with the economy's trajectory looking really strong in recent weeks, um, I wouldn't be surprised if that's a source of, of free cash next cycle. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Jim, if the government, federal government, doesn't extend some of those um, relief for municipalities, 
is it likely that we might still burn up 350,000 in, in the next cycle for unemployment? In the next cycle, you mean, you mean the next fiscal year? Or? Next fiscal year, yeah. I, I don't see that happening. I just wanted to be cautious with this. You might recall that last year at this time, exactly this yeah. time, we had, I think it was 525,000 in OPEB and uh, 300,000 in stabilization. So yeah. I think next year, if we're looking good and we're trending pretty well, I'd probably go back to pre-COVID numbers, which was about 1,150 budget in that line, and probably move the remaining 250 or so over to, uh, you know, split it between those two accounts or whatever. Okay. Alrighty. Any other questions on unemployment compensation? Did uh, Andrew or, release did you, his hold? Oh, yeah, Andrew, did you release your hold? Sorry. Yeah, so yeah, I, I'm done. Thank you. I released my hold. Okay. Alrighty. Mark, uh, yes. Mark Sullivan, I, I have a question. I didn't raise my hand fast enough on the employee <laughs> retirement assessment. Okay, go ahead. Um, I'd just like, Jim, to just, um, one, how's North Fork doing with their actuary, actuarial um, information on the pension? If we're going to cover this at another time, I'm fine. And also the, the OPEB at 100K, um, is this the amount that we're planning to to contribute this year, or is it just a partial amount? So I guess I'll answer that in two parts. Um, the first part is the uh, retirement information. So next, I believe you folks are supposed to set, uh, to discuss the citizens petitions articles on the 8th. Uh, I am on page 10 of a memo for you folks of uh, explaining each one of those articles. For the most part, the retirement section is taking up the that article 20 the most amount of time and effort to kind of research that. Uh, from the information I've found, the, the county system, they've been really good to work with and to get me some information on Mr. Peel's articles. So they're on track to be fully funded still by 2029. So um, they're, they're trending well. The rate of return on investment is 7.75%. So um, it's looking good. And of course, next week, I'll have a whole lot of information for you folks on the retirement system. Um, and as far as the OPEB, so a year or two ago, we implemented a policy um, that we, that our financial advisors suggested, set a policy for your OPEB that you know you'll be able to meet every year. And that policy specifically states $100,000 should go into OPEB. Um, so that's why we budgeted for it again. We cut it last year. I mentioned it was 525. So I'm confident we'll be able to do the 100,000. And one of the things on my to-do list the next two weeks is to kind of look at free cash, where we're trending and everything. And, present a couple of options to you folks for, I think it's article 10 or 11, which is the OPEB article. So it depends on what your appetite's like, Mark. And I'm not just saying that, it's you yeah. folks are gonna really dictate, do we bother putting anything extra in there? We have a separate article for it, or do we just leave it, so. Yeah, because right now we're carrying just over 900,000 of free cash into the Springtown meeting, correct? Yes, and right now we have about, I think Snow and Ice is down to about I think it was either 180 or 200. So we're, every every day I wake up and check the 10 day forecast as does Rick and Drew. So we're, we're, we're trending well. So maybe we'll, we won't have to dip into overlay or free cash or something else. So, um, but I think I'll have, I'll have a lot better sense in uh, mid to late March where we're at with the free cash if I need to even touch it. Okay. And also where you think some of the next year's free cash might be coming from, obviously. Yep. Like you mentioned with the um, unemployment compensation, we still have 280 there. And it's a we, got the, we got the prison mitigation in about yep. two or three weeks ago. That was 800. Okay. We sold the house on um, uh, going to off of 27. I forget the name of that subdivision there. And we sold another house near a uh, lot near uh, Walmart, which brought in close to a million. So that's 1.8 million off the top. I know we're getting. So. Okay. So, so if we wanted to, we can go through our stabilization in OPEB and run down that 900,000 to practically zero, knowing we've got well over a million something coming in to free cash in the fall. You certainly could. Okay. All righty. Thank you, Jim. I have a quick question. Yes, Ellie. Um, Jim, can you, when you bring that OPEB information, I'm just going to assume that you're going to bring forth the, what we did a few years ago with what our plan was. For the oh yeah, yeah. I, I bring that memo out every, every yeah. yeah, every time this year. Yeah. I know last year we had a lot of discussion because we were not able to follow through. 
um, with it, just with all the uncertainty, but just a refresher on that. No problem. Good call. Yep. Okay. Good idea, Ellie. Okay. Any other questions on uh, assessments and fringe benefits? There being none, can I get a motion uh, for total fringe benefits of eighteen million nine hundred ninety-seven thousand three hundred and twenty-nine dollars? So moved. Moved by Denny. Second. Uh, I heard two voices. Who is who's in first? <laughs> Brian. Brian. Okay. <laughs> Ryan's the second, then he's the first. Okay. So we have a motion for favorable action on assessments and fringe benefits. Denny? Yes. Josette? Yes. Allie? Yes. Andrew? Yes. Steve? Yes. Susan? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Kathleen? Yes. Brian? Yes. Doug? Yes. Mark? Yes. Lisa? Yes. Okay. Uh, Lucy did not show up yet. Okay. And myself? Okay. 1300. Zero, zero. Favorable action on assessments and fringe benefits. Okay. On to public safety. Did, Jim, did you want to do an intro first? or? Yeah, sure. Um, if you like. Uh... I, I know you folks have given you kind of a, a heads up on the ch major changes to uh, police and fire budgets. Uh, I've also mentioned in the budget message. So I'm on it. I'm just assuming that there's going to be a hold on police and fire. Um, and does anybody have any questions specifically about uh, the inspectional services in there? Um, no, not much of a change. Um, so I guess I'll go to inspectional services. Weights and measures. Uh, anybody got questions about that? Okay. Um, emergency management, pretty much level funded. Roger's still there doing a great job. He's been a he's great asset over the last nine or 12 months now. So uh, anything on emergency management? And last one's animal control. And if you don't mind, Mark, I'll just give kind of a brief intro to animal control since it's sure. a smaller budget. Yeah. Um, John Splane retired uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, and the chief and I got together. Obviously, the ACO falls under the uh, police department now, but we work together on this one because it's kind of one of those hybrid departments. Um, I'm working with Norwood to try to build a regional, regional um, ACO position where we may have up to three different people who cover both towns, which we basically would have a department head and two deputies. I like the idea. I know the chief likes it. I know the Norwood general manager likes it because it gives us 24 seven coverage 365 uh one thing with john is he lived right on west street he was always out there responding whether it be two o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the afternoon and that's the big thing with the police department deers get hit all the time you know coyotes get hit and you know you got to be out there and do kind of a gross job no one really likes to likes to do that uh so we're hoping we can get something together with norwood if that is the case we're able to do it um, I'd likely, you'll note that I added a line in here called professional services. Right now, I just threw in uh, 69.45. That was our remaining money with the health insurance once that kind of worked itself out. So that's more or less a placeholder for me. What we'd likely do is similar to what we do with the veterans agent. We pay Norwood, they'd cover the OPEB, the health insurance, the salaries, all the, you know, the night coverage and everything. <clears throat> and it would just be a bill that we would receive every month or quarter so it's in the works nothing set in stone uh, i know norwood's going through a tough time with their assistant gm bernie cooper passing away so if we're not able to get like if they get bogged down and we don't get any movement on it we probably will just stay on our own and just post the job and see what we get but i'd love to do a regional thing with them because i think it'd be beneficial for both towns Jim, so. do they currently have a three-person staff or a two-person staff? No, actually, John used to split it with Henry, Henry Serkra. Okay. Henry's a Walpole resident, but he covers Norwood. So okay. the two guys would switch off, and each one would get a stipend of $10,000 from each town to cover for vacation. It really worked out well. So we more or less, we had an intermunicipal agreement where yeah. we covered them, but they just have Henry right now. Okay, so, so they... If we get the agreement, they would hire the second person and potentially a third person, and then we would just put them. Okay. Yeah. 
they cover OPEB, right? which I like. Yeah. You just get a bill. And, you know, it, it, I think it would be, it, it's worked pretty well with the um, midfield on the veteran services. So uh, we'd look to mirror that. But more to come. And if it, we go, I can't leave this position open for too long just because with the, the cold weather kind of hopefully moving on, the animals, I think, will become more active and we just won't be able to afford to wait to fill that job. But it, it's a tough one to fill. Okay. Thank you, Jim. So okay. that's it. So I guess we'll hop back to, to police if police. everyone's okay with that. Yeah. Um, just for reference, tab five in your big package, if you've got the full budget book, has police and fire in it in detail. I don't think there are any changes from, from what was in the book to what you gave us for a handout, right, Jim? Uh, no, not in those two departments. Nope. Okay. So if you're looking for the full detail, it's in tabs five of your, your, your big binder. Questions on police. Obviously, we've got a lot of information was sent out by the chief in advance. Uh, current staffing, the hierarchy of responsibilities, um, wonderful PowerPoint on their priorities and where they see the department going. Um, any specific questions for the chief or should I just have them do a rundown of, of where they see the department going? Andrew and then Brian. Hi, um, really appreciated the chief uh, sending this thorough um, uh, report to us. And so I had two sets of questions. One was about um, staffing. I'm, I'm in support of the three officers, the two that are already on, and then the new one. Uh, but this is more of a kind of big picture conversation. We've talked about this with the fire department, and I believe Chief Bailey uh, even had a specific number. And so I guess my first question is, what would your number be? I know Walpole is going to experience a lot of growth in its population. It already is. Uh, but with the new complexes um, being built, uh, apartment complexes, AQVs, whatnot, we're going to experience a lot of growth. So what would your number be in terms of officers per thousand people? Um, and then I'll, uh, yeah, that's just my first question. Chief? Hi, good evening, everyone. Great question, uh, Andrew. So, the, there's no real magic number. I think that uh, if you look through the strategic plan, what I think that where I think that we should at least try and maintain is about 1.8 officers per thousand. Um, and as you can see in our area, that varies depending on the size of the department, but also enough, a lot of other analysis, not just based on population, but also based on um, crime statistics. You know, your your UCR and and NIBRS crime statistics, part one, part two crimes. Uh, it has to do with, you know, geogra geography and, you know, where Walpole lies is, is in comparison to other places. You know, I think that, you know, we may be busier than other communities because we have I-95 and Route 1 and um, Route 27 and 1A. Uh, so those are busier thoroughfares. Um, and as, as you look through the, the back of the strategic plan, it kind of identifies, you know, where the things that we should be looking at for staffing um, in the past, you know, thankfully, Jim and uh, Finance Committee town meeting has seen the need to increase staffing as the Walpole Police Department was very stagnant for a long time. In fact, it was the same amount of officers that when I came here 25 years ago uh, to where it was two years ago. Um, and while the town grew, the department did it. So just in the past couple of years, we've start, now started to try and increase the staffing as the uh, town continues to grow. We were at about 1.4 or 5.6 area uh, in the last uh, few years. And just last year, because uh, the town gave us the two additional officers that we just hired, uh, or in the process of hiring right now, remember we phased them in, we didn't hire them right in July. We, uh, we hired one Tuesday night and the other one's getting hired in, um, in March. So we phased those two in. Those will be, you'll see kind of that addition increase in the budget for next year because there are two, basically two new officers. And then we requested the third, which will put us at 47 officers and in the area of that 1.8 officers per thousand. Um, if, you know, where we get that information is through the um, Bureau of Justice uh, and Statistics. And, um, you know, like I said, in our area, it ranges. It could be anywhere from as, as low as, um, you know, 
1.2 or 1.3 offices per thousand all the way up to 2.5 depending on a lot of the circumstances so i can't give you an exact number i think what i think is um, you know within the next couple of years we should probably be at about 50 officers if we had 50 right now would be at about two offices per thousand um, but the town's growing i think we can expect it to grow another two or three thousand people over the next few years Great, thank you for that answer. And uh, just to look at your strategic plan here, which again is really thorough, um, and under that uh, first strategy, you mentioned those Bureau of Justice statistics numbers. It seems that towns in our ballpark of 25 to 50,000 typically have about 1.7. But again, I, you're the expert here, uh, I'm not, in terms of what are the risks the town faces. Uh, the Route 1 corridor, 27, 1A, would I would imagine lift that number higher, but the relative uh, low crime rate of this area compared to the nation as a whole would lower that number. So uh, just to reiterate what you said, you, you want a minimum of 1.8. I agree. I think we should have at least 1.8. Um, but I mentioned this, uh, even though it's not directly related to this immediate budget, because uh, I know the select board is uh, planning a, uh, to have an update of the master plan, right? This is a 20 year plan. Uh, it was last completely done in 2004. And I would love to, you know, have conversations both as a finance committee member over the next two and a half years, but also uh, who, whoever's on the master plan steering committee, I would hope have conversations with the police department about not just what the lower bound is of 1.8, but what an upper bound is in terms of the officers per thousand so that we do recognize as lawful growth, we do have to add officers. So to me, it makes sense to add officers as we grow. But, um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if the master plan steering committee looks at the evidence and maybe sees the two two point you know zero officers per thousand as an upper bound. Uh, just to have a conversation about, you know, it's tough to, you know, forecast the future, but it would be good to know just how much more the department grows as it as the population grows. So that, that's just my comment. And I just hope we have a, um, a real constructive conversation led by you, the expert um, and the experts in the department. My other set of questions was in uh, strategy number five. Um, we talk about all the uh, new <laughs> mandates and all the new laws passed, uh, whether the state police reform bill or the um, executive order from the federal government. Um, and so, my question is: uh, There's a page in the um, there's a page in the strategic plan about police reform where you where you mention. Um, and it, it doesn't have page number, so I apologize. I, I can't tell you what the page number is. But you say that as an example of the magnitude of state and federal mandates, uh, the Walpole Police Department policy and procedures now complies with the aforementioned act, which is the state police reform bill and federal reform, uh, including but not limited to addressing, and, and, and you, you bullet point a lot of things, deadly force, chokeholds, on down. And so my question is, um, how has the Walpole Police Department policy and procedures been updated in the last year? And, and I, 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 don't, I don't fault you with it, because I know there's a lot of new mandates and a lot of new legislation that just passed. I don't fault you for you know, taking some time. You say later in, in the section, over the next couple of years, the WPD will be required to accomplish these mandates. But I'm just curious, um, in the last year, how has the policy and procedures uh, been updated based on these new state and federal laws? Sure. Um Excellent question. So what we did here in Walpole, uh, the, the um, Justice, Equity, Accountability and Law Enforcement Act, that's what passed on um, December 31st of this year. The governor signed it into law. There was a, multiple different versions of it. Uh, we ended up with the last version that became Chapter 253 of the Acts of 2020. Uh, that is the, it's, in short, it's the police reform bill. Um, so the Walpole Police Department, we try, we, we've been going for a certification and accreditation for several years now. And we've now um, put all of our policies and procedures and rules and regulations in place for us to achieve the 153 standards of certification. Um, and we're going to be going into the process of um, our, our, um, the, the um, accreditation commission coming in to the department pretty soon in the next uh, six months or so. So we've been, our policies and procedures are updated constantly as laws change, as regulations change, um, as we as policies need to be changed. Uh, and with the police reform, a lot of this started back um, over the summer or before the summer when there was an incident um, 
with George Floyd in Minneapolis. And um, this started a lot of push for police reform, um, including here in Massachusetts. So the, the items that you see that are currently in the um, strategic plan, the Walpole Police Department, based on the, um, the acts, the acts of 253 of 2020, we have already implemented all of the um, changes that have been part of that bill so far prior to them being phased in across the state. So there's deadline, there's different um, phased in approach for different items in the law. And the law is about 120 pages long, but um, basically uh, there's a lot of policies and procedures that can change right away. And there's others that get phased in over the next year. So the items such as use of force standards, um, whether it be, uh, chokeholds, um, duty to intervene, uh, shooting at motor vehicles. Um, uh, there's a whole host of uh, policies uh, and changes um, that, that could be made. So we've already made them. We've made the changes. We've been, we're training on those changes right now. Um, and we did that much prior to uh, the deadlines of th this happening, which is like July and then summer, September and summer, December. Um, so the 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 uh, the future part of that is that we're not done yet there there's a commission the post commission still has to be created which is the commission that's going to certify all police officers in massachusetts they're going to certify all the agencies in massachusetts and then they're going to continue to provide uh policy changes and enact parts of that law that um can't fall into place until the commission is created and then there's going to be a um, police training council, which will still fall under uh, the executive office of public safety and security. And they will be coming out with a series of things that we'll, we'll need to train on. Um, so while we have made some, the immediate uh, changes to our policies and procedures and trained on that, there's going to be a lot more changes that are coming ahead. And um, as far as the, the president's executive order, that one there has um, about 10 standards, which almost mirror the uh, the state standard. We already implemented that as well because they, they, they're very close to what we needed to do here in Massachusetts. And we do apply for a lot of federal grants. And if you do not accept at least the mandatory um, standards of the president's order, we are not able to um, apply for federal grants. So um, we have, we, we've put all those um, policies in place. We've achieved all of the standards and um, it'll be nice when we do go apply for like state like uh, traffic grants and that kind of thing where we're, we're now meets the standard and we'll be able to get those grants. Great, thank you. And just one follow up, um, just so I understand. So it's great to hear that the department's policies and procedures have been updated. Um, and you know, there's a whole list of um, items you, you, you have here, but to pick two, say chokeholds and no knock search warrants. Your policies and procedures, if I understand you correctly, have been updated based on the, the state police reform and, and the federal federal guidance, um, the federal executive order to uh, not allow no knock search warrants in the uh, in the domain that I think they uh, the state law says that they're not allowed and, and also ban chokeholds. Right. So so that's already updated. That's correct. Great. And then so my last question is, this is awesome that the department policies and procedures are updated. Um, how is their training and communication to the current officer corps when those procedures are updated? Because, you know, I assume your patrolmen are busy keeping us safe and we appreciate that. And they may not be following the latest legal changes from the state house or from Washington. So how do you, when you update the procedures, is there kind of a new training that says, Hey, we're no longer allowing chokeholds. We're no longer allowing no knock search warrants. How do you c communicate that to the officer corps? That's correct. They're trained on it. So what we do is, you know, you the finance committee has heard me say before that Walpole PD is very self-sufficient. So we have trained officers in Alice, for example, the critical incident response. We have officers trained in Asher, the, the another critical incident response. We have officers trained in uh, as armorers and different um, uh, specialized types of trainings. That also includes we have use of force. We have use of force officers, range officers. And so when we adopted those new policies, created our language, um, 
those do not come in, they don't take effect until the officers have been trained in it. Um, and so what we do is we, we complete the policy, we release the policy, and then we train on the policy. And that policy doesn't become effective until everybody's been trained on it. Our officer, we have certified officers in use of force and, and, and range instructors and all that kind of thing. So we do it internally. We can, some of the training is done um, in roll call trainings. Some of it is done where we take officers off the road. If we have extra officers on a shift, we'll take them off the shift and we'll train them. Or um, sometimes we have to do it on overtime. Uh, and that's why our overtime, our training budget's important because as these things roll out, you know, we may have to bring officers in on overtime. If it's like a hour, hour, half or two hour training, you know, sometimes that's what we have to do um, in order to achieve that. Items like the, um, the no-knock search warrants we put that into effect immediately because we, we we execute search warrants and we wanted to make sure that we were already reaching the standard right now. Um, personally, and I know the deputies here too, we're not big fans of no-knock search warrants to begin with. However, they've, we've done them because they've been necessary to do. Um, but now, you know, the standard that we have um, reflects exactly what it says in the police reform and, and that's how we'll uh, do them from here on out. Well, thank you so much. Before I release my hold, I just want to compliment the department. I've had to do some business uh, at the uh, police station in the last um, six months. And from the administrative staff on up to the deputy chief, uh, Rich, who I interacted with, uh, there was just a lot of professionalism and efficiency. So I appreciate that. And I release my hold. Thank you. Brian? Uh, through you, Mark. Uh Chief, thank you for sending the strategic plan. It really makes uh, us going through line by line really easy. Uh, it's great to see the vision the department has. <coughs> and thank you for being on the forefront of, of all the change that is going on with policing. Um, I wanted to chat about uh, strategy eight and the IT. And I know you're currently using a, a vendor, Delphi, and thinking of going in-house um, and I totally understand a lieutenant shouldn't be responsible and, and behind a desk uh, fixing radios and social media. They're more valuable policing, which is what they're meant to be. I just, is this something that um, is a full 40 hour position that's needed where Delphi is only 16 hours? Um, how is it going to get funded? Is there collaboration opportunities with the fire department and their IT? I'm sure they might not have as much IT need as, as you do, but is that something that yeah, could so, work? Um, so there's a lot to this question. Um, the, the police department, you know, we, we, we request to have a, a full-time IT person. However, that's expensive. Um, you know, to, to get an IT person to cover what our department does would run, you know, we've done some um, analysis. It comes to about eighty-six thousand uh, dollars to get somebody um, that's trained in the the interoperability that we have here at the Walpole Police Department. It, it's not a typical job. I think you need some special, um, I think, training and expertise in what we have because we have systems that connect to FBI databases, to criminal justice databases, to the registry of motor vehicles, to um, interoperability with the schools, with the fire department, with the Boston area radio network. We have 911 systems. We have radio systems. Um, it, it, we have you know the the key locks and everything to get into the doors. So there's a lot of um, technology that we have. Uh, Lieutenant Zangetti, who was uh, here internal in the department, is extremely um, tech savvy. Um, me and the deputy here are not. Uh, Joe does a great job, um, kind of. Uh, picking up the loose ends on our technology, but Joe's also not trained. Uh, he's not he's not properly trained or, you know, he doesn't have any um, real training in that background. So w Delphi is a company that works uh, primarily with police agencies. Uh, they're expensive. Um, and, uh, you know, they run about, they actually run about $135 an hour. We have them for about 16 hours a week right now, um, but we really do need 40 hours because Joe picks up on kind of the slack and, you know, we're, we're going for accreditation and uh, we're doing the police reform stuff and there's a lot of other things we'd rather be doing, um, you know, but also the good thing is for the town of Walpole is that 
an, a, our own IT person would be expensive, but we only have to pay about um, around thirty thousand dollars for Delphi out of our own budget because we use our nine one one grant. Um, we have the nine one one incentive grant and equipment grant that we have for our nine one one system that runs about eighty thousand dollars a year. Uh, and so essentially what we do is we take that money and we put it towards the, um, the IT stuff. Um, and they're very good at it. Like Delphi is an, an incredible, um, company. They do very well. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just kind of weighing, um, where we're going to be going with this in the future. And, um, that's kind of where we are with it. So would, would this position, would this potential person be a Delphi employee or would be a, uh, a town of Walpole employee? How do you find somebody that's just trained in this type of computer, you know, the, yeah. all those? Uh, well, so when we kind of survey around, we find that what people typically will do is a company like Delphi, somebody will branch off and where, where there's somebody where they have that background, like our cruiser, or the MDTs, we have computers in the cruiser, right? Like those are all tied into the FBI, and the CGIS and the registry motor vehicles. We have electronic citation computers in there now that are tied into the registry. So the, like the Delphi guys know how all that stuff works. Um, and so it's, uh, you know, it's you, it would usually be somebody that branches off or breaks off and leaves a company like Delphi to work for a police department. That's what we've seen across the state pretty much. Perfect. Thank you. Appreciate it. I release the hold. Chief, on, this, on that same uh, train of thought, do other <clears throat> do other towns still basically sub out to Delphi? Their IT supporters, do some of them actually have in-house people at this point? So, uh, some of them do, yeah. Uh, so that's how we found out about Delphi. Other, other departments in the area also use them. Uh, and... Um, it, it varies. It, it varies on the size of the department and, you know, what they do and, and, and that sort of thing. And, and just what the town's preference is in that particular community. I was just curious as to how um, other communities were um, handling an in-house IT person basically full time. If they found that, yeah, they're maximizing the 40 hours a week and they're really getting the bang for their buck or they find that they've actually you know, there'll be some weeks where they only need them 24 hours and the school department's borrowing them or, or you know, there, there's potential downtime that another department could tap that resource as an, as an extra set of hands. Right, yeah. You, you know, part of this too is, is this is all new technology. Uh, we've been in the station for almost three years now. Uh, we're still very happy to be here too, by the way. But um, it's, you know, when we, when we moved from the old building to the new police station, the town was very good about giving us a, a, a state of the art facility. You know, this, our, our dispatch area is now combined police and fire public safety dispatchers. Um, it's basically the emergency operations center for the entire town during any emergency. So, we, you know, we, we invested right, like we made a good um, uh, system here, um, but there's a lot of technology. Um, I think we might have put in the strategic plan, just the comparison of what we have now when we moved here compared to what we had in the old building and it's it's like night and day. Okay. Uh, my, my other topic is on the actual um, shifts and I, I'm just confirming the, the first watch is actually midnight to 8 a.m.? Yes. Okay. And, and looking at the, the manpower staffing, you basically have uh, two openings or maybe even three openings that you'd eventually like to get into that shift. That's right. correct, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the new hire that you're shooting for based on your priority is going to fill the one vacant shift on the third watch? Um, so the, the first one we have will probably go to the open shift on the, on the 12 to 8. Um, oh, the, oh, we'll go to that one? Okay, because I was yeah, looking at priorities. So now we just the cat's out of the bag. She knows what shift she's going to. <laughs> okay. Uh, so you are going after that, that, that first big weakness, even though your your priority was the third watch. Okay. That's correct, yeah. The third watch um, will be the second one, so we're going to try and fill that one slot on the midnight shift first, and then probably the second one will be filled uh, from the officer that we hire in March. But okay. they, that's still a ways off because they have 12 weeks of field training to do. Right, okay. And the other I had was um, 
I, I saw in your strategic plan that you've got your command structure upgraded. Um, so now you have basically four product lines, if you want to put it that way, with an independent lieutenant or the deputy chief responsible for those four, each of those four categories. With regards to shift supervision, are you looking to hire a sergeant in your next round of requests, uh, not necessarily this coming fiscal year, but you know, the next year after that, are you going to go to a sergeant level um, to eliminate possible overtime on, this, on the uh, supervisory side? So maybe if you look, so, um, and this is the great thing, like we're making progress, right? So we went from when we made that third lieutenant, what we did is we freed up an administrative sergeant that was responsible for a lot of uh, like um, special events and community policing issues and, and things like that. Once we freed up that sergeant, they, we can kind of um, roll them back into patrol. So now we have eight sergeants um, that can primarily, seven of them are always on patrol. And then one of them is the detective sergeant who's in charge of investigations. And so that when, when, it, when it did that, like our goal is ultimately going to be able to eliminate the OIC position where we have a police officer that's in charge of the shift and always have a sergeant, a supervisor on duty at all times. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we didn't put anything. We haven't requested a new sergeant yet, but probably in a couple of years, um, you know, that may be necessary as, as the town continues to grow and the department grows. But right now, having that fourth component you know, we have not now have administration, we have investigations, we um, we have patrol, and then we have special services. And you've seen in the organizational chart how those four main components work in the department. Okay, alrighty. So I, I'm just thinking from the command structure, though. Um, none of those command officers work the first watch, though, correct? They don't. No. Um, yeah. They, they are all responsible for the, what's under their um, tasks under each of those uh, components. Okay, so so they will they would most likely be a second watch person in for the most part of their schedule. That's correct. Until we get to the point where we can eliminate that OIC spot, we hope to fill those positions with you know a sergeant or a superior okay. officer. All righty, thank you. Yep. Any other questions for the chief? I have a few questions. Okay. Actually, I saw Doug's hand first, then you, Mark. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, mine's um, myself too. That's uh, more of a selfish. Uh, okay. Yep. Uh, yeah, mine's just kind of a selfish, selfish question about the um, traffic woes by the Elm Street School. Um, I've had the luxury of picking up my kids more often uh, than I have in the past, and it's always kind of a disaster with the cars, you know, pulled to the right on Elm Street, and I wasn't sure. Um, Sometimes there are officers out there doing traffic watch and sometimes there aren't. And I wasn't sure. Uh, it always seems to be a disaster. Uh, cars are always there. It turns into three lanes. I wasn't sure um, if that was something that was kind of on your radar. If you, you know, obviously there are officers there sometimes, but they're not there all the time. And I just wasn't sure kind of what the rhyme or reason was. Um, it's just. Yeah. So, I, you know, obviously, like we don't have. We don't have the manpower to have the officers at the schools all of the time and each school, you know, we have all of the different schools. This year is very unique because we have, we're, we're during a pandemic and um, the vast majority of parents have, including me, have decided to drive their children to school as opposed to taking the bus. So it's created a lot of problems. Um, and so, you know, we do try, it, it is on our radar. We do try and put officers up, you know, when we can, but um, you know, a lot of times those are busy times for us too, right? Right after school or right before school, um, there's, you know, there's calls coming in and we're, we're dealing with all. So we can't like dedicate somebody there. Um, but it's certainly, it's, it's definitely an issue for the whole town. Um, all of the schools are, are kind of experiencing the same thing right now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mark. Um, Chief, again, thanks for the um, the write up. I'm I'm just curious. So I'm just in general. I'm looking at the public safety. You know, it's roughly about 11 percent of the town's budget, and this year it's growing at roughly six and a half to seven percent, and it's all primarily in the personnel services. 
So, you know, as a town, we're seeing the public safety keep growing and growing. I note that, you know, in 2012, I, I was struck by those charts you sent. 2012, there were 34 officers and the population was 24,500. And now we're at 25,000 and we're at 47 officers. So the, the population's grown 2% and the number of police have grown about 38%. So that the numbers, so I, again, I, I don't I don't challenge the, the budget that's here and stuff, but I'm just as a town wondering, you know, the public safety continues to grow. I understand the population's growing. What I'm curious is with this population growth and like over 55 housing, apartment housing, is that, require the same type of number of officer ratio as like um, subdivisions do or single homes? So uh, great question. So when you look at the, uh, the amount of officers that are in those charts, the staffing of the department was 40. We didn't have 40 officers though, because a lot of times when, if you go back, I've, I've been here for 25 years. When I came here in 1996, the staffing of the Walpole Police Department was 41 officers. At five, 10 years before that, it was 40 officers. We don't always have 40 officers because people retire, um, people, or, or for whatever reason, um, they've left or transferred. So there's times, if you look back, I think it was around 2008, 2009, we got all the way down to 33 officers or 34 officers. Um, I happened to be a patrolman then, and I don't even recall taking lunch breaks back then because we were so busy. It was right when the um, it was right when the um, the, the um, economy kind of crashed, and we were going to we were having all kinds of house breaks, and we had robberies back then, and it was it was very busy. Um, but we we were still staffed at forty or forty one officers then. We just didn't have that many on the department because mm -hmm. of retirements and everything else. So we haven't increased. In fact, in the 25 years that I've been here, we never increased at all. And that's part of the problem. You know, Jim and I, we've, we inherited the, you know, these departments in the town with stuff that nobody increased as, the t as time went on. The town was growing, but nothing, you know, the departments were. Um, the departments were not. And so now, the last officers that were hired over the last few years have been catching up to where we should have been 15, 20 years ago. And so we're still trying to catch up and, and now the town is continuing to grow and we're gonna continue trying to catch up. Do you consider the town to be any more or less safe than when it was back when you were, you were struggling to, to catch up? Um, think I, so. Trends change. Policing policing has changed tremendously, as you know. Like the police reform mm -hmm. and everything. I've never seen anything like what we're going through right now, and it's a lot. It's a lot of change and, and adapting to things and uh, realizing a lot. Of, you know how policing has to be and how we have to adapt. So there's a lot of things that have changed in that respect. Our job has completely shifted from, you know, a a, a narrow focus on crime to a very broad focus on community policing um, and, and dealing with things much different than we did 20 years ago here. Now, you know, if you look at the mental health, like the, one of the charts in there, you'll see last year we went to 621 calls that were, rel that were late associated with mental health. That's gone up 100% every year, like over the past uh, several years substance abuse issues. We don't arrest everybody for possession of drugs anymore. What we do is, you know, we go to an overdose or something, we're trying to give them resources and we're trying to um, help the family. Uh, and we seek alternatives to arresting people um, because we learned that, you know, handcuffing everybody doesn't solve all the problems. Sometimes it does, sometimes it's necessary, but we've completely changed our focus with juveniles, with mental health, with substance abuse, all of this stuff, um, and and these things take. When we talk about, you, you know, you've seen in the uh, document problem solving oriented policing. The whole goal of that 
is to get away from arresting people for every infraction and trying to um, create these alternatives and, and create and give them resources that steers them away from the criminal justice system instead of into it. Um, mm -hmm. And so, okay. so I think in doing all of those things, it takes a lot more time to spend the time at an overdose scene with the victim, with the family, going back and dealing with them, trying to get them and take them to re uh, rehab or treatment. Um, every time we deal with a mental health situation that we're there spending time trying to de-escalate it and, um, and, and, and bring in resources and bring in Riverside and then get them treatment and follow up where, so, you know, in the past it was handcuffs. Okay, thanks. So, so how many um, in the last couple of years How's the retainment of the police officers? Do you have a high turnover, low turnover? We we have we have people that want to come here from pretty much. People want to. This is a great department. We have great people here, and people want to come here. We don't lose. We've lost one officer to um, a transfer, and that was an officer who went who was able to go to a larger police department in Quincy. And he was from Quincy, and he's he's there, and he's doing uh -huh. a great job. Okay, Jim, I'm just curious with the number of calls that in the chief's report, like to to the Lincoln School and the others. And, and again, I'm not begrudging them or anything. Is that are they like state schools that we can charge them for the number of calls the services we're required to support? So I can tell you that at least the, the school, the Home for Little Wanderers, I've, I've talked to the executive director about this multiple times. I've asked them to add items in the st uh, state budget to budget for some time because we basically serve as their security force up there, the Walpole Police Department. There, it, you know, there's times right now, I think it's been, they're kind of in a lull, but there's been times where they're up there, you know, a dozen times, half a dozen times in one day. Uh, maybe on one shift. Uh, so we've advocated for that, but they're not required to to pay for that because they're a nonprofit and they don't pay taxes. Um, I believe like the league school, that's a similar situation. So um, okay. the, the one that comes to mind the most that I've asked for is the, the home for little wanderers, but the, unfortunately the, the funds haven't been there. Okay, the other question I have is, and this kind of goes to both the fire department and the police, and it's on the, the education incentives. So when, when I look at the, the police amount here, it's roughly about 10% of the budget with the officers you know, going and getting associates, bachelors and master's degrees. Um, I, I assume that you know, it's part of the contract. And again, I'm, not, I'm just trying to, to understand it. Is the town better off like hiring an officer and then having them go, or a fire department, and having them go and, and go to school? Or are you better off, like, with the hiring requirements saying that the officer or fire personnel will have that degree already, and therefore we're not paying for the stipend? So on the, I'll answer for the police side, then Chief Bailey could answer on the fire. Um, on the police side of things, there is, um, no better investment for the community than to have educated police officers. When I came on the job, um, I hate saying that, I, I guess I'm old now, but when I came on the job, um, we, they weren't educated. We didn't have education. Like we, there was usually officers came out of the military and they were hired on the police department or, or the, the, the standard was that you had to have a high school education and I think that, you know, years ago, that was part of the problem. And, you know, fast forward to today, Massachusetts police officers are much more educated. I think our whole, our whole state is in comparison to other states, but our officers are much more educated than our counterparts in other parts of the country, i.e. Minneapolis, where you see these terrible situations occurring. And it's an investment to have educated officers that, um, know how to deal with things that have conflict resolution that that have an education background um, that helps them in doing their job and there's certainly a, a, a divergence between agencies across the country where they have high school educated um, entry level and here uh, in Walpole where you have you know patrol officers that have master's degrees and you know we um, 
there's a lot to be said about that because it makes us better. A lot of times when you see these situations that are occurring across the country, and I've been asked right out here in front of the police station why it's happening. And I said, because a lot of these places, um, they don't recruit right, they're not trained right, and they're not educated. And that's why you have these problems. And so um, I know it's a lot of money. It's, it is. Um, but I think it's a, it's a tremendous investment. Okay, I'm all set, thank you. Um, I think it was Allie next. Yes, thank you. Um, two questions, which one was, I was just looking for an update on the Home for Little Wanderers and the resources that are you know being utilized. I know a few months ago you sent out a large memo. And the second thing I was just looking for an update was after town meeting um, and the EpiPens and how that is going in the training um, for that too. Sure. Um, so on, on the Longview Farm issue, um, we have two police liaisons that work with them. And a lot has happened since those memos went out. Uh, we work very closely with Rebecca down there. She's the director at the Home for Little Wanderers. Uh, and we have really made uh, tremendous um, progress with DCF, who oversees the Home for Little Wanderers. Um, our two liaison officers, Officer Van Ness and Officer Bird are now um, allowed to participate in the meetings with the Home for Little Wanderers and DCF. And they're allowing our input and in identifying kids who are at risk a lot sooner than they were before. And this was primarily the major problem that we were running into. Um, you know, we certainly recognize that the kids that, that, that live there are um, come from extremely difficult um, traumatic backgrounds. And uh, we're always empathetic to that. Um, and, and, you know, but they, they're prone to run away. And so the, it generates a lot of calls, um, whether they, they be uh, mental health issues or assaults or, or running away. Uh, a lot of different issues that we were dealing with and uh, uh, incredible amount of call volume. You know, last year we were responded there probably um, 250 times for um, a variety of things, mostly missing persons and runaway type calls. But those calls would generate a lot of um, resources. You know, if a kid runs away at two o'clock in the morning up there, that's our whole ship that's tied up there looking for that child until we find them. And what it's done sometimes, it left the rest of the town uncovered for hours. And, you know, that wasn't fair. And, and Jim's worked very hard and our select boards worked very hard to work with them. Um, we have made some progress. It's not going to, it's not perfect, but um, we're going to continue to work with them and, and, try and make things um, as, as safe as we can for the kids and for the community down there. And I know in the letter you had written for a cease of that, but all the homes that we that were current are still operating. The, the home is still um, operating, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And I'm sorry, what was the other question you had? Yeah, uh, just an update on the EpiPens and how that's going in the training and it's going very well. So we, we hit the ground running once um, town meeting passed everything. Um, Sergeant Hazeldine, like, you know, when I said, like, internally, we have um, officers that uh, have a lot of different uh, specialties. She's a trained first responder trainer and EpiPen trainer and, and um, CPR as well as AED. So once we um, got the thumbs up from town meeting, we immediately trained the entire department, including our dispatchers in um, the EpiPen. Uh, and so now uh, the tep Deputy Chief Kelleher has gotten us all of our licenses through the DPH and everything and uh, through the medical control. And we're now fully able to use the AED, the EpiPen, and Narcan. Um Comes a little cost. I mean, to that, we have, when Norwood Hospital um, had their situation over there and the hospital shut down, we used to be able to get our Naki in there for free. and. We haven't been able to do that, so we've had to seek a vendor so we can purchase Naki and we have to purchase the Epi. And within within a week of everybody being trained, one of our dispatchers um, assisted somebody uh, through uh, EMD emergency medical dispatch in appropriately administering the EpiPen and saved a little um, little child's life up at the uh, mall. So it already paid off. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, were there any other <clears throat> any other hands raised? I didn't catch everybody in that first round. 
other questions or comments for Chief? Okay. There being none, we'll move on to fire. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, everyone. Got to Andrew with his hand, Mark. Uh, Andrew? I know. I was just waving goodbye. I was just oh, giving okay. a thumbs up. That's all. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, Andrew. I saw the hand go up. I thought you were asking. <laughs> okay. Alrighty. Chief Bailey, welcome. Uh, good evening. Uh, let's see. We, we have what was last year's budget and this year's budget, and uh, we do have an increase, but did you did you get what you were hoping for? <laughs> I, I know the police got some sizable jumps, but did you get what you were hoping for? Yes. Okay. A a any increase is good. Okay. <laughs> Questions for the chief? Mark, if I could just add a couple sure. of things. Uh, yeah. Uh, earlier this week, the select board voted to um, uh, support the chief's uh, endeavor to pursue the safer grant, which it looks like we're going to try to go after up to uh, nine firefighters uh, funded by the federal government over uh, a three year period. And basically, I'll try to put away a few a hundred or so somehow in the fire budget. So we're not trying to make it up. I'm thinking of just basically putting it in the uh, overtime line as a placeholder. But you know, I'm the chief's gone for this in the past, but I'm you know I'm optimistic uh, that we may maybe we'll get we'll get something here. I think we have enough time. I know the chief and deputy chief are working hard on this one, but it was good to have the board come out and support that. So, um, if that's the case, it would take the, his uh, the groups up to uh, two add two on per group if we're successful in that. Okay, Jim. Sorry, can, I don't mean to interrupt, Mark. Can you explain that grant a little bit? What's this, nine firefighters for three years? No, it's, uh, the Chief, jump in once I'm done. Uh, it would be uh, up to eight firefighters. Federal government pays for the first three years fully funding their salaries. It's a program they have. It's called the SAFER Grant. Uh, Chief, did I miss anything really on that one? Spot on on that. It's highly competitive, but, you know, I'm an optimist. It's, so, so uh, is is the town then expected after the three years to retain the officers? Yeah. Yes, and that's yes. one of the reasons why I said I try to, because I, I wouldn't want it to be a budget buster in uh, you know, year four. I would try to basically build us up because roughly with health insurance and by the time you outfit the firefighters, uh, you know, cover the education, the paramedic costs, it's close to about 100000 or so a year all in. So, um Obviously, I wouldn't want to add eight hundred thousand in you know three years from now, but I try to build it up a little bit. So, so okay. Chief, real quick, right right now, your current staffing is eight firefighters per shift, and yeah. and your minimum is seven, and we're looking no. to make the minimum nine. No, no, our, our current staffing is ten per shift, and our minimum is eight. Okay. Normally, however. Since COVID last March, our minimum was increased to nine okay. so that we could open station two to provide social distancing. Okay. We are still at that level currently. The select board a month ago uh, granted me the okay to continue on with keeping station two open at least until July 1, and okay. then we will reassess. So that's currently where we're at. Okay. I, I was looking at strictly the, the firefighters and that, including the... Uh the um, leadership team of captains and lieutenants. Okay, alrighty, thank you. But, but theoretically then, these eight, in three years, you'd basically be adding about 18% increase in personnel to the fire department. That's correct. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It's a big jump. It is, but, well, Mr. Well, Chairman, actually, do, you, do you want me to explain that or? Sure, please. So, as you know from me coming before you in the past, um, a lot of things have changed in the last year even that have, have caused cons of concern for our staffing. 
even though we've increased the, to the nine so that we have ample people to staff both stations with our minimum, uh, those ambulances, because Norwood Hospital is closed, now our transport times are anywhere from 20 minutes to 40 minutes longer than they were before. We're out of the service area, so if we before, if we were at the hospital, we could recall an ambulance, and then they would finish their paperwork on the previous run uh, when they went back after the second run. Our uh, mutual aid has increased by almost 60% um, being received and giving uh, since the hospital closed. Uh, it's put a tremendous burden on us. What happens when that happens is uh, it leaves us with both ambulances out of town and it leaves us with four personnel to cover the town of 21 square miles and 25,000 people. Our call volume has gone up. We're very busy and it continues to go up. It's gone up about 25% uh, in call volume since 2014, and it, it continues to go up. This past year, we had not only COVID that we dealt with, which actually had a little bit of a lull on the ambulance runs from the month of March until uh, just about the end of May, and then things started to pick up again. But we also had several major storms, um, which also taxed the department, taxed the town, all the departments. Um, we had a storm back in early February um, that over the course of two days, we did 85 runs. It's um, very taxing and this is an increased safety measure. This will allow us to, with the eight, to get up to close to where I had said before was, was the minimum of having two staffed engines with at least three on it, and both ambulances and then the captain in the car. But is this then going to allow you to um, staff accordingly? You know, I, I've asked you in the past about, you know, everyone seems to be a firefighter. Everyone seems to be an EMT paramedic. And did you need so many? And you pointed out rightly so that you were understaffed. So now with picking up a staff, are you going to be able to, for instance, hire people that are firefighters and that don't become EMT paramedics because the town doesn't necessarily need them so we can save money. I, I guess my overall concern with public safety is, again, compliments to both departments, the chiefs, they do a terrific job. There's not a lot of turnover. So what happens is our employees, and they deserve everything they get, but they're going to become very highly paid, very highly educated, and they fill all the slots. So from a personnel cost per firefighter or police person, it's going to be very expensive. And, and you don't see like higher ones, higher paid moving out and lower ones coming in. And so my concern is, is that our cost per firefighter and police officer will become very expensive in Walpole just because you don't have a turnover that that moves to people. And, and again, I want to be very clear. I'm not, you know, bad mouthing any of the departments, any of the people at all, but just the way the model is, that's what's going to happen. We're going to have a very highly educated, well, very well professional force, but will be also very high, you know, highly compensated. Yes, yeah, so the only thing I could offer to that right now is that it is part of the collective bargaining agreement. It's part of the uh, hiring process that everyone has to be a paramedic upon entering um, the fire department. The education is also a contractual agreement that uh, mm -hmm. was bargained for. So that would have to be all changed through collective bargaining. All right, understood. Thanks, Chief. Just one other thing, though, is that unlike a lot of the other collective bargaining agreements in town, I think the fire department only has six steps for their firefighters we have six on the firefighter the yeah. yes and three yeah, so on the look office. at some of these other agreements people are hanging around for 15 years with you know step increases for 15 years these guys max out in six years and then it's just cost of living adjustments after that so um you know they, there's always they, the stipends yeah mm -hmm. yep I, okay. again I, i'm not trying to bemoan anybody on the departments or anything. I just want to point out the way our model is right now in the town, that that's where it ultimately leads to. And there's no, no relief valves about bringing in 
or, or trying to make a lower cost unless you go and, and handle it through contract renegotiations. Right. Hey, Mark. Um, actually, I saw Ali first, then Denny. Thank you. Um, a few quick things. I'm really excited to hear the update on the safer grant. I think we've been talking about that for the last few years and I'm hopeful that we will get into that. Um, we'll be talking about shifts, Chief Bailey. I feel like in the past, uh, you did a presentation maybe two years ago, you were saying ideally you need 11 firefighters per shift? At a minimum, correct. At a minimum. So although we talk about minimum eight and nine COVID times, I think we're still lacking. We're still behind that. Uh, we built this new fire station, it was built for 11 per shift. So I'm very hopeful that the safer grant um, will come to for fruition and we'll get that. On that note, Secondary question is how is uh, turnover the department been and how is it getting firefighters through the academy? Prior to COVID, this was still a difficult thing. Has that changed at all? Uh, it has changed. Um, as of a couple of weeks ago, the wait time for the academy is down to zero. Um, <clears throat> there, there aren't a lot of people going through the academy right now. Um, it, it has had an impact on who's being sent <laughs> Now, with that being said, things are starting to come around again. We do have a third academy that's online now. Uh, the, it's an adjunct site. It's in Bridgewater. Our uh, Three of our personnel that uh, have recently graduated went through the Bridgewater site. Um, they do some of their stuff at Bridgewater, and then for any of the live burns, they have to go back up to Stowe. But it does help to get through a uh, quicker uh, turnaround time. So right now, that is uh, a positive and um, they are still operating. And so through this time, we've been able to, I know you say, talked about getting a firefighter up and running. It's about a hundred thousand dollar investment. And in the, in the past, we've lost some, unfortunately, I think too soon after we started the process. Have we been able to maintain firefighters in a, in, currently? Uh, yes, we have. Um, as Chief Carmichael said, we, we actually have a lot of people that are interested in coming here. Uh, since the new building was finished, uh, we haven't had anyone leave other than through retirement, and um, hopefully that trend continues. That's great to hear. Um, I'm almost done. Two quick secondary, we kind of touched base about it, but the local hospital being closed and the runs, where are we going? Um, I know the hospital, It's now they're saying years um, before that's going to be open. Is there a plan for Wapple? Is there anything that we can do in the, within our department budgets to help with that? Uh, build a hospital? No, uh, just meaning like the <laughs> transfers, like you said, there's two ambulances, the two ambulances are out. Right. You know, can we add a, you know, is there in the projected that we add a third ambulance or staffing and things like that? So I, I do have a third ambulance. Uh, we do not staff it other than with recall personnel. Um, one of the reasons that we, we've been asking for more personnel is because years ago, uh, when I came on to this department, our call for fire for fighting force was actually bigger than the full-time force. Our department has transitioned to all full-time because it was very hard to keep those folks uh, involved. And as we added more full-time, the reason, the necessity to call back people diminished, and because it diminished, the interest wasn't there, and it was also very hard to get people, train them, spend a lot of money training them, getting them up and up to speed, and then to have them leave six months to a year later, and then have to start that whole process again. The town made it a, a decision to head in the other direction, which has been much better for us as a department and and as the for the community. Um, but I do not have the staffing other than when we recall people to, to staff the third ambulance. All right. And, uh, Allie, if I could just give you a quick answer on Norwood Hospital. The chief and I have been both really advocating hard for, for getting that place back up and open. It, it's just in limbo right now. I, I gave the, I'm just pulling up my update from the select board earlier this week, and that update included the following. Some area managers and I met with Sal Perla, who's the president of the Norwood Hospital last week. He explained that they have no set ETA to open the hospital. They're hopeful that the insurance claim will be resolved in May or June. Um, I did ask them if opening the hospital or shuttering the hospital altogether was being considered. He said it was not on the table at this time. That's a real concern of mine. Uh, he's agreed to come back to the to our monthly meetings uh, to give us you know, five or 10 minute updates, but 
the big problem with this uh, with this situation in Norwood has been the insurance claim and the back and forth and handling small insurance claims for the town. I, I understand that. I can't imagine what a hundred to five hundred million dollar claim is like. It just must be through the roof. But you know, the chief, both chiefs, and I and our groups are, are really advocating for that. All the area managers and the chiefs understand how important it is. I mean. I think the chief ties up an ambulance for like two or three hours once it goes to Brockton or whatever, because okay. you get the travel distance there, you got to unload the patient, then you got to come back. Uh, it's, it's it's tough, and I'm you know yeah, I, it's been complicated with COVID. Yeah. Um, my final thing is uh, Op Station Two, uh, the commitment to keep it open until July. Has that been helpful overall, and is that something that um, would be looked to the future to continue having it open if possible? Uh, yes, it is. And, and I'd like to go back to your last question for one second. You asked where we were transporting. So we're transporting to uh, B.I. Needham, Newton, uh, Newton Wellesley, Good Sam in Brockton. We will go down to Sturdy or we go into the city. So that's where most of our transports are going. Most of them are between Needham and Brockton. Yeah. And the time frame is obviously double. So on, on we did some uh, statistical analysis of where we were back in uh, 19 uh, on an average shift the guys were tied up for five out five and a half hours at the hospital on ambulance runs throughout that tw a 24-hour shift that has increased to si almost seven hours now uh, on a 24-hour shift where they're out and, and not available to us here in the community so it has had a huge impact on us um, we are relying on not only our mutual aid partners, but they're relying on us. So we, we're all helping each other out trying to get through this. Yeah. As far as uh, East Walpole goes, uh, it has been a tremendous help to have that station open down there. I would like to keep it open full time. I was actually the chief. Um, I've been the chief since 2005. So I was here when we opened the station and I was also here when we had to close it due to the layoffs in 09. At the time when we closed it because of the layoffs, uh, it was agreed upon that that station would not reopen until we could staff it properly. But that was one of the reasons that we asked to get um, an extra person on and, and change our minimum from eight to nine. Uh, the select board was uh, very accommodating to allow me to do that. Um, so we do have some level of safety down there as opposed to having one person left if the ambulance left out, at least there's two there now. Um, I would like to keep that open. It also still allows us, even though we've had the vaccine here at the fire department, um, there is still a lot of uncertainty out in the community as a whole, it, it just in everywhere as a whole uh, with regards to the virus. It still allows us to provide our social distancing and keep our crews uh, isolated from each other. Uh, we do work scenes together, but the, the living arrangement is is separated so that we can try to reduce exposure. We handle all of our calls that way as well since COVID. Uh, we try to reduce our exposure when we go to a home by, by limiting the amount of people that go in. We treat every call as if it is a COVID positive uh, for our safety and for the safety of the people that we're dealing with. So there's been a lot of changes, uh, but we've been able to meet them. Yeah, and thank you for all you've done. This has been a difficult year for, for all the departments. Thank you. Uh, Denny, then Jeff. And then Brian. I see his hand's gone up. Oh, Brian's up there too now? Okay. Yeah, hey, Brian, hit the little raise your hand button so you come in the order. Makes it easier to figure out from this end. Uh, I will say Ali probably asked uh, most of the questions I was going to ask. Uh, so I'll, I'll be quick. One one thing I did want to ask uh, uh, Jim uh, and Chief the the grant that we're applying for. Uh, you know, Jim, you mentioned that you're optimistic. Is that you just being an optimist, or uh, is there any reason to be optimistic? You you want me to answer that, Jim, or he, he asked to. Who do you want, Danny? Chief. Sorry, I couldn't I'll find my either, mute either one of you. I could see him looking for the uh, <laughs> the mute button. So yeah, Chief, I'll let you take it. <laughs> okay, so uh, it is a highly competitive grant. It is nationwide. They give out about three hundred grants roughly a year. Um, we're hopeful. It, one of the cr main criteria for the grant is to get you to meet 
or, or to uh, trying to attain the level of NFPA standard 1710, which is to increase your staffing so that you can have 14, uh, 15 to 17 people on scene within eight minutes. Uh, as long as you're moving in that direction, your grant gets a gets looked at in a different light as opposed to you just want to hire eight people and that's it. So um, they, they, there's a lot that goes into it. Uh, I have to tip my hat to Deputy Barry. He has been spending a tremendous amount of time on this grant, uh, working towards uh, giving us a favorable. He does very well with the grant, so uh, we're hopeful, as Jim said. Excellent. Danny, Danny. I'm just being optimistic because, you know, I think I think I, our, our budgetary outlook is really good. Um, we've demonstrated that we can weather this COVID storm. You know, just the feedback I received this past week when our borrowing numbers came in, it was really good and really positive. And that's just me being an optimist. Good. I like optimism. No problems with that. I just wasn't sure whether there was anything behind that. Uh, one, one last question on that and everything else I was thinking Ellie asked. Uh, the 100000 that you said, that's if we get the grant, you'll start putting that into the budget. That isn't something you did this year, correct? No, actually this year I put in, um, I think we funded a position for about three quarters of the year through and something I mentioned to the select board is we'd wait to fill that position so I could almost get a head start. So we could say the federal government will fund you know, that position, the whole, all eight of them, but at least I'll have 50 or 60,000 tucked into this budget one way or another, because I put that money in there without knowing what the status of the safer grant, there was a question as to whether or not it was even gonna come out, so. And is this something that we'll know quickly on, or is this a long grant process? So the grant awards will be starting uh, roughly the last week in May, and all the grants have to be uh, distributed by the end of September. Perfect. Thank you, John. Uh, let's see. So we have Jeff, then Brian, then Josette. You're muted, Jeff. Yep. Yeah, I'm new at this. All right. <laughs> Chief, Bailey, Chief Carmichael stated earlier, kind of as his department grows, where where he was planning to make changes on the command staff level. You have similar, um, you know, expectations that as the department grows, you'll obviously need additional command staff support. Uh, yes, I do. So. Um, Unfortunately, getting guys out on the street is my first priority, uh, but we really should have a full-time training officer, but more importantly, a full-time EMS officer. Uh, the EMS component of our businesses is, is a huge component of the fire department. It's actually like running two different things here. I run the fire side and I run the EMS side. I do have an EMS coordinator and I have a, a QA, QA, QI coordinator who actually looks over all the runs for efficiency and to make sure that we're following all the state protocols. That job, responsibilities of that job have increased tenfold uh, since we started taking over the ambulance 20 years ago. And uh, that would be a position that I would lo look to fill. The first one, uh, which was a, a, also of a critical need is the fire prevention officer, which is in there uh, this year to be funded and uh, one step at a time, unfortunately. So. Thank you. Thank you. Ready, uh, Brian. Uh, through you, Mark. Um, I'm really excited, Chief, for this uh, safer grant, and and uh, hope it comes to fruition for us. Um, I'm also glad that the fire prevention officer is finally going to be happening. Uh, I think it's well needed and uh, will help alleviate some stress on on the force. So. Um, a little different than, than Mark Sullivan's take on, on the staff. I'm very glad that both of our um, police and fire stick around, are well trained. If somebody has to knock on my door, that's what who I want saving me. So um, that's the perspective I come at. So kudos to both of you for that. Uh, my question is, um, with this new construction long-term plan of 1A, uh, how do you see that impacting you? and will keeping fire station in East Walpole open help? So that is a, a major concern of mine. Uh, all the construction that's gonna be happening, um, the Route 1A project, and then if they do the other uh, improvements on East Street, 
which they're being talked about, those will also fall within that time frame of, and being able to get to East Walpole will be a little bit of a challenge. So uh, having that station open will give us more flexibility to respond to that end of town uh, if need be. Don't, we haven't really seen the phasing plan yet from uh, DOT with regards to uh, how they're going to phase the construction of 1A. So um, if, if it's to impact us, which we believe it will, um, it would be very beneficial to keep Station 2 open. If we are fortunate enough to get the grant, I would advocate to keep that open. And I do have a plan in place to present if and when we get the grant to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Josette? Well, everybody has pretty much covered the questions that I had written down, which is awesome. Um, so it's more of a comment that I'm really glad that you have applied for the SAFER grant, which you do historically. Um, so I'm very impressed with that. But I'm coming more from a safety aspect that our firemen are going to be a lot safer, especially with all of the new construction and the height of the buildings that are going in this community, that um, I think we're at a point that um, we are just very fortunate this is all coming together. We've had to deal with COVID and you've done an amazing job, but to have this opportunity and hopefully it will um, present itself so that we will be able to get the benefit of having the five men that we need in this community and it's not because of the lack of trying chief <laughs> so thank you very much thank you right. uh so andrews and then susan hi uh two quick questions i hope uh the first one is just to confirm the total number of firefighters currently and then when we add one more is it 34 to 35 we're currently at 40 and when we add well depending on what happens so if, if the grant doesn't come through jim has another position in there which would get me to 41 that would uh, take effect approximately right around november 1st december 1st right in that area that's with the 56, 50, 56 or 7,000 that he has in there uh, for an additional firefighter. That's starting mid-year. If the grant comes through and we get the eight, then that position that is in there would not, that money would stay, stay there. And as Jim mentioned, he would use that trying to get towards the finish line of after the three years. Okay, so I, I, I just asked that total number because, um, so there's 40 full-time firefighters because- That's correct. Okay, gotcha. Okay, so just as a side note, walpolefire.com, your website says 34 full-time firefighters, paramedics, and chief officers. It's probably been a few years. You've been really busy, rightfully so, but I just wanted to uh, make sure I got the right number. So it's gonna go from 40 to 41. Okay, um, second question. I have is about the uh, fire prevention officer. Seems like a great idea. Uh, we would need this. Um, how common is a full-time fire prevention officer in surrounding departments? Just about everyone has one. And, um, okay, and, and many, many of them are um, either a higher rank deputy chief or they're paid at a different rate of pay. They're paid at the higher rate, a captain's rate of pay. Gotcha. So um, the fire prevention officer, because of the name, because of the word officer, are they a, a full on firefighter and, 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 and paramedic? So in our case, the, they, they will be um, a lieutenant and they will have all the benefits of the collective binding agreement. So it would be a promotion from within the department. So yes, they would have their paramedic, their EMT, Gotcha. Okay. Um, no, I, I just, I, yeah. Oh, no, it's, that's good to know because I just didn't know what kind of scope this position would have because, you know, uh, fire prevention seems very important. I just didn't know if it was something that like the veteran services agent or the animal control officer, uh, it was a type of position you could regionalize across different towns. 
you're telling me it's, it's common to have a full-time high ranking, uh, firefighter who's a paramedic who has experience lieutenant who who does this role many departments have have that uh position in in several departments they actually have more than one person in that division fire prevention is a very big um responsibility within a community and it's it is what it is no, I, I, I think this is great. So uh, I support the budget. Uh, thank you, Chief and Deputy you. Chief Barry. Appreciate it. That, that position, Andrew, is very specialized um, with regards to the codes and what you need to know. There's a lot of training that goes involved, is involved with that position. Yeah, I was just going to quickly follow up on that. that. That position is not strictly just doing building inspections. It's doing plan review and making sure that sprinkler systems are adequate for the construction that's taking place. Um, and everything that is tied into new construction plus ex inspecting existing facilities, correct? It, it's all life safety systems within, that is correct. Okay. Alrighty. Mark, just a follow-up question to that. Are fees charged when the fire prevention position goes out and, you know, examines sprinkler systems, does inspections? Does the town charge developers and construction people fees for that service? We, we charge for the permitting of whatever devices that they're putting in. We charge for plan review. We, we have an extensive schedule, uh, a, a fee schedule that we do use, yes. But most of it is for the permitting of the work that's being done. Thank you. Okay, Susan. Thank you. <laughs> Through you, Mark. Um, a lot of good questions tonight, and I appreciate those who've gone before me with those good questions. So it leaves me with really nothing but comments. And I wanted to just say to both chiefs that um, I know that our numbers have been low over the 11 years I've been on finance committee for both Chief Carmichael and Chief Bailey. We've kind of struggled over the years to try to build up your staffs. And I'm very happy that we're inching toward um, what, what are more ideal numbers for our town, particularly in light of all the new growth. Um, I want to just comment on how well you've met the challenges of both not having Norwood Hospital open and um, COVID, which has uh, significantly impacted all of us, but particularly your work. Finally, I just want to note that um, we're very lucky. We have um, two wonderfully professional um, organizations in the police and fire department here in town. And I'm acutely aware of the fact that with your departments, when things go wrong, they can go terribly wrong. We're literally speaking about life and death. So I just wanted to say personally, um, and as a member of Finance Committee, how much I appreciate the good work that you and your staffs do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Any other questions or comments with regards to fire and for the chief? Don't see any more hands. Jim, can you just confirm the amount for me for public safety? It's kind of tough to read. Looks like twelve million eighty-one thousand three hundred eighty-five. Twelve million eighty-one thousand uh, three eighty-five. Correct. Okay. All right. I'll entertain a motion for action on public safety. So moved by Second. Denny. Okay. Second. Second by Susan. All righty. We have a motion and seconded for public safety's budget. Denny? Yes. Uh, Josette? Yes. Allie? Yes. Andrew? Yes. Steve? Yes. Susan? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Kathleen? You're muted. You're muted. You <laughs> should try it. <laughs> <laughs> The old space bar didn't work. Hey, yes. Yes. <laughs> Brian? Yes. Doug? Yes. Mark? Yes. Lisa? Yes. And myself? Favorable action 1300. Thank you, Chief. All right. Um, Thank you. Jim, did, did we include minutes on tonight's agenda? Um, I believe so. I, I know I, dis I distributed two sets. I wasn't sure if you actually posted it in the agenda. I believe Kelly had that covered, um, okay. but I don't mind if you wanted to wait. I don't know if everybody's had a chance to look it over. Did everybody get a chance to look at the two sets of meeting minutes that we sent out? Yeah. 
Okay. Um, I'm, I'm seeing heads shaking yes. I don't see anybody saying no. So, um, well, I have, Mark, I have not. You have not seen them? Okay. I have not had a chance to look at them. No. Okay. I'm, I'm in the same boat as Jeff. We, we, we can hold off till Monday and do a bit um, when we get done with the school committee. Already. On the agenda for Monday. Yeah. Uh, yeah, right now it's just the school committee on Monday. Um, we have the packages. I believe, Jim, everybody's got a package. I believe so, and if you don't, let me know. Uh, Mark, if I could just touch on a couple of quick things. Uh, sure. I know you talked about Walpole Media Corp. Uh, initially, we postponed them until uh, next week. Um, after talking to uh, Tamara, who's the director, and Gene Kenny, who's the chairperson, um, they the board is set to consider some of the uh, final items on that on March 10th, so we're going to yeah. push that to March 15th. Um, March 15th, um, Mark and I talked about having a meeting to go over the personnel articles that were held off and so we can cover the Walpole Media Corp uh, budget. So what the plan will be on March 15th, if everyone's okay with it, is we'll, um, I have an extensive detailed memo about contracts and all that background information. Um, if you, besides the contracts, I'm going to touch base with Mark to make sure I'm not missing anything. But I think that was really the big thing that tied up the, the personnel articles. Am I miss, if I'm missing something or there's something else with the personnel board articles, let me know. I know, uh, I think a couple of you had questions about Juneteenth. I think those were addressed by you individually. So if, if you have something, just shoot me an individual email and copy mark on it. So. Well, actually, real, real quick on the Juneteenth, I, um, when we had our discussion the other day, you and I, you said that police and fire automatically are going to get that because they recognize all state holidays that is in their contract so so, so they already will have that um as a holiday where they'll get overtime for the guys working that shift Correct. The guys who don't work the shift who aren't scheduled for that day do they get any kind of compensation it'll be treated the same as a, any other holiday in their contract okay yeah all right uh so that's that and then i just want to give you really some excellent news that um uh, I believe Lisa and Jody are still on this call. So uh, earlier this week, uh, we received the bond results for about a $4.5 million borrowing that went out uh, earlier this month. Uh, most of the borrowing was for the fields projects, a little bit for street improvements and the emergency generators. The average interest rate that came back with the low bid was uh, 1.062, which is uh, great since we were budgeting last year with Maryland at 4.25%. Uh, I estimate we say it's a 15 year borrowing. I estimate we saved about $1.3 million by waiting uh, from borrowing last year at this time to waiting a whole year. So the select board is gonna be asked at their next meeting to approve the results of the bond sale and sign the necessary bond documents and legal paperwork. And I think, um, you know, one of your upcoming meetings probably is part of your packets. I'm just gonna throw some of the comments in uh, the, that our financial advisors have, have given us just to more or less say what a great job Jody and Lisa have been doing. Um, they've been great and uh, we're lucky. I, this this rate blew me away. I was really surprised. It, it's basically 1% to, to borrow for $4.5 million. So that's really good news. Yeah. Amazing work, ladies. Yeah. How do we get in on that? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could get that rate. <laughs> You need to be a hundred million dollar enterprise. <laughs> okay, uh, that's uh, it. Don't get that right. I can assure you of that. <laughs> All righty. Um, since we're going to postpone reviewing the minutes until Monday, uh, I have nothing else on the agenda. If there's no other questions or comments, Andrew has. I have a question. Uh, so, just review our next few meetings. We're meeting with the schools on next Monday, the first. Yep. We're keeping next. Thursday the 4th open in case we want more discussion with the schools, correct? Yes. Correct. Then put a, just I'm going to come back to the 8th in a second. That's the night of the citizens petition. Yep. No meeting scheduled for the 11th. And then correct. on the 15th, Monday the 15th, that's the personnel board articles 234, and that's Waffle Media Corp, right? Yes. Yes. Now, my question for Jim is, I hate to ask uh, town employees time, but on the night of the citizens petition, um, Melissa, who does a fantastic job in the Board of Health, were you planning on asking her to come to that night? And the reason I ask is reading the um, citizen's petition to eliminate single-use plastic bags, it seems like the Board of Health would be the enforcer for those fines. 
And while this is a very common art, it's a very common thing. I have 180 cities and towns, Massachusetts, I think, or more do this. But I would be curious, like some of my questions as I review this plastic bag ban article have to do with enforcement. And, and, and if Melissa's department is going to be charged with that, um, I don't, I hate to ask people's time, but I just, we're wondering, were you planning on asking the Board of Health to be there? No, but, <clears throat> excuse me, no, but uh, actually, I'll type up a quick memo to Melissa. She's always flexible, so I'm sure it won't be a problem. If it is, it will be postponed. I, I agree with you, Andrew. I, I honestly didn't even, I've been so focused on the, the zoning overlay with the solar stuff <laughs> and the other citizens petition with the Norfolk County. I didn't even think of that, so. I'll ask Melissa if it's an issue. Um, I'll probably ask you just to push it off or something to go around uh, her schedule. But uh, if, it is, if it is a problem, I'll let you folks know. If not, plan as if we're going to discuss it. Sure, yeah. And I, I, and I don't mean to throw a wrench into the plans. I just thought that may be a source of the questions that come up. But the, uh, but the, and, and the second follow-up to that is, is what you just said about the zoning articles that are citizens' petitions. You mentioned the solar overlay. So we keep having this chicken and egg game, I think, with the planning board, where they have their public hearing on zoning um, bylaws. And I, I don't see a public hearing scheduled before March 8th. Um, so I assume we're going to just hear out these citizens' petitions. For the, and it's not just the solo one, right? It's uh, South Walpole Stadium parking. Um, and we'll have maybe uh, the building inspector, Mike, uh, uh, maybe at that meeting. He was there, I think, last year when we discussed this. Um, but I just wanted to know if there was any communication with the planning board about, you know, for, for, for scheduling our vote, our finance committee vote, if they want input on this, because last year, like happens with a lot of zoning articles, we approved these citizens petitions. And then there were kind of technical minutia, uh, literally wordsmithing typos that I think tripped up some of these bylaws for six plus months. So I'm just wondering if we could avoid that again. Um, and then for the citizens petition on the retirement system, luckily we have Jody and Lisa and you all uh, who are fantastic to help with the debate over that. So I just, I, the reason I bring it up is it's 10 days away, 12 days away. And I, I just hope we have an ability, if we can knock it out and vote on it, to have the people there to answer the questions. That's all. So just if I could answer. So the finding the planning board is actually holding their public meeting via Zoom. I have the notice here on Thursday, March 18th at 715. So I think I understand what you're saying, Andrew, and I, I, I was a little frustrated with the, you know, the way everything went kind of as we got closer to town meeting last time around. So uh, I think we have everyone scheduled. I know uh, Phil Mackey's set to come in and Cindy Hogue from South Walpole. I'd hate to have those people juggle things around since they already know it. So I think you could, if you'd like, you can hold off. Um, I know the chairman had, uh, the chairman of the planning board made some suggestions to both Cindy Hogue and the petitioner at the time for the zoning overlay. Um, I believe his suggestions were adhered to. Uh, so I think for the most part, everything should be set with both of those articles. But if you'd like, we can hold off until a, you know, a later meeting date. You are set, I think in the beginning of April to meet to cover the in-year budget adjustments, snow and ice, OPEB stabilization. So you can cover it that night too. At least you can hear what they have to say. That's all. That's my. This is up to Mark and and Denny to decide the scheduling. But I I, I ask it just it's I, it's good to hear that March 18th. You're telling me the planning board is having a public hearing. Yes. Because that's not on the and that's that's understandable. It's not on the town's calendar. But that's good to know. March 18th that they're having it further out from the town meeting. So thank you so much. That's all my questions. I have a question before you close, um, Jim. You did say that um, you have a lot of material you're gathering regarding the citizens petitions um is that also including i'm assuming but i'm going to ask um the uh, town attorney's comments uh yes the town so, attorney actually uh she is wor working on finalizing hers so there'll be uh she'll have a detailed opinion included as part of that memo great thank you hey, jim just on those um zone, on those uh citizens petitions any documentation for Article 20? Can you like do a page break so that starts clean at the top of the page? Just because I know I want to kind of like organize my stuff, and it's like if that could be a clean set of pages. Yeah, sure. No, that's easy. No, As opposed no. to starting in the middle, it's like it just makes it a lot easier for me to just jump right to it and find it. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Because I know you said you were 10 pages of stuff, and it's like 
Yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, there being nothing else before us, so I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Moved so by Danny. Right. Seconded by Josette. Sure. <laughs> I, saw, I heard Josette and Danny right, one right after each other, so. Sure. Fine. Whatever. <laughs> uh, uh, noted here. Okay. Motion to adjourn. Denny. Yes. Josette. Yes. Allie. Yes. Andrew. Yes. Steve. Yes. Susan. Yes. Jeff. Yes. 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 Okay. <laughs> Kathleen. Yes. Uh, Brian. Yes. Doug. Yes. Mark. Yes. Lisa. Where'd Lisa go? Lisa. Yes. Okay. And myself. Okay. Thirteen zero zero. We stand adjourned until next Monday. Thank you, everyone. Thank Have, you. A nice Have a good weekend. Have a good weekend. Bye. Bye. Bye.